church worship service. Uh, we'll be coming back to in-person services starting March the 7th, uh, but for today, we're going to be online. Listen, go to TWRtimes.com and pick up your listening guide there. Uh, you'll go to TWRtimes.com and then go to News, Church News, and then you'll see the opportunity to uh, download your listening guide there, and the sermon links will also be there. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I invite you to open them to Second Peter, and uh, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. We start a new sermon series this morning. Before we get into our message this morning, though, I want to ask you to join me in a word of prayer to prepare our hearts and our minds to be able to receive what the Lord has prepared for us today. Father, we come before you right now. We ask you, Lord, to prepare our hearts and our minds like fertile soil to receive the seed of your word, Father, that would be deeply implanted in us, that we would be more than hearers of your word, but we would be doers as well. Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, and we give you thanksgiving and praise for all that you're going to do in and through our lives as you speak this word into us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus was a master carpenter during his earthly life and just before he began his earthly ministry. Uh, today, he continues to build and establish his church. But his church is not a building. It's not a structure. It's not made of brick or steel, stone, wood, or glass. Uh, the church is not a place. It's not a location. It's not an address. The church that Jesus is building is composed of people. And uh, what kind of people, you may say? Well, the kind of people who are established as spiritual temples, offering their lives to the uh, as spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to the Lord as their reasonable services, Paul says. These people are born-again believers who have received by faith Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It was Jesus who said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And these people have received Jesus by faith. They've made a public profession of their faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as the means by which their sins have been forgiven and eternal life has been granted to them. These people have been identified with Christ in baptism, and they are the church. The church that Jesus is building is full of, uh, of people who are praying people, who talk with God and who walk with God and who listen to God and who desire to share the Lord with others. The church that Jesus is building is full of sharing, caring, uh, serving people who follow the example of Christ and desire that uh, the world would see and meet him through their lives. This is a church that Jesus is building. So somebody may say, well, who can be a part of Jesus' church? You can. You can and you should be a part of Jesus' church. Uh, I heard about a man who was, wanted to sing in a church choir, so he went to the pastor and he asked about singing in the choir. And the pastor asked him, he said, well, are you a member of this church? And the man said, well, no, sir, I'm not a member of this church. And the pastor said, well, are you a member of any church? And the man said, well, no, sir, I'm not a member of any church. Uh, I'm a member of the invisible, universal church of God. And the pastor quipped back. He said, well, then why don't you go sing in the, inv in the invisible, universal choir then? Uh, when we think about the church, we think about two very important aspects that are equal about the church. There is the invisible, universal church to which all believers in Christ belong. But then there is also the, the uh, local church, which is the visible representation of the invisible church and its reality. Now, yes, you can be a part of the universal church and not be a member of a local church, uh, but assembling together is a mandate that we're given in Scripture, that we are not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves, and we're to take that serious. Jesus gave us the church. I believe He gave us the church because He believed in it. Paul's letters in the New Testament are written to local churches. Jesus Himself addresses seven local churches in the Revelation. He gave us a church because He knew we would need it. And it is through the local church that we establish family and fellowship ties and where we find our support system that we need in an otherwise hostile world. So I want to encourage you today. If you're not a part of a local church, if you're not a member of a local church where you're meeting with others, serving and growing together, you need to find one and you need to get plugged into that church. Uh, you'll not only be fulfilling a biblical mandate 
to assemble together, but you'll also be building lasting family and fellowship relationships that help to lift you up. I believe in church membership. I believe that the Bible teaches uh, church membership. I believe that church membership is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, second of all, it gives you a sense uh, uh, of commitment to the statements of faith of the church to which you belong. It, it shows a commitment to the other believers in the body. Uh, it creates opportunities to serve and to share with others. It, uh, it, is, uh, it stands as a good testimony for us as we work together to represent the church in our local communities. And it shows that we understand Jesus has a real love for the church. So over the next four weeks in this sermon series, uh, I want us to take a serious look at our love for the church, the church that Jesus is building. I've titled this series that, uh, The Heart for the House because we are the house of the Lord. The people of God are the church, and we ought to love Christ's church, and uh, we ought to resemble the kind of church that Christ desires to build. Now, what does that church look like? Well, Peter calls the church the new Israel, and in our text, Peter is speaking to the church today, even as Moses was speaking to the people of God, and God was speaking through Moses as he established his covenant with him in Exodus chapter 19. So in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, I invite you to read along with me. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is saying to us this morning through this text, he is saying that w uh, this is what we the people as the church should look like. The, the church that Christ is building. First of all, notice with me this morning the very first thing. He says, listen, we are a chosen people. This is not just merely a uh, compliment, but it's a divine commission. In the Old Testament, Israel was a chosen people of God. God had called Abraham, and then later through him, he chose the nation of Israel to be his people, and he would be their God. It was God's desire at that time that Israel would be a fruitful missionary force in the world, and Israel would carry the, the, the message of God's grace, love, and goodness into the world, and the world would come to know the Lord through their testimony. But Israel failed to bring forward that fruit uh, that the Lord desired, and so he extended his call to all people. Now that shifts us into the New Testament, and when we come to the New Testament, on the day of Pentecost, God used new chosen people. And on the day of Pentecost, that day, the Lord chose 120 disciples who were gathered together in an upper room who were praying at that time to be come the new Israel. These people would be who God would use to carry his redemptive ministry into the world, that uh, they would be the ones that would introduce the world to Christ and that the Christ would be known by them and through them. Scripture tells us that, uh, that in Acts chapter 2, that on that first day of the church, on the day of Pentecost, that when Peter stood up to preach, 3,000 people were added to the congregation in a single day. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing because of the events that took place. There was a mighty rushing wind, the Bible says, that came from heaven that proclaimed the very breath and life of God was abiding within this body of believers. The Lord himself breathed his spirit into these new disciples so they would become the living body of Christ. There were tongues of fire that lighted upon the heads of the members of this infant church. And that was kind of like the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament, revealing to, uh, to everyone the glory of God's presence was upon them. And it was in these miraculous events that God was announcing to the Jews and everyone else in the world that Jesus indeed is the Messiah, the Son of God, and his disciples were the new Israel, the new people, the new chosen people through whom God would do his work. Listen, God is never limited by biology. Uh, he's not limited to the seed of Abraham uh, or to his descendants to carry forth his message. And through faith, believing upon Jesus, even now Gentiles, and, as, as well as Jews, can become the chosen people of God. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. On another occasion, he, he had already told him, he said, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, 
showing yourselves to be my disciples. So at this point in history, we have the, the people of God who are the church, and they are the chosen people of God. In his uh, book, Rising Above the Crowd, the story of Ben Hooper is told. Now, Ben was born in the foothills of East Tennessee to an unwed mother. And as a result, both Ben and his mother were ostracized by their small community. At the time of Ben's birth, being an illegitimate child was scandalous. My, how times have changed. But that's how they were then. And Ben was 12 years old when a young new preacher came to become the pastor of the church that was there in their little town. Ben started hearing exciting things about the preacher. He heard that he was loving. He heard that the preacher was non-judgmental and how he accepted people just as they were and how he made them feel like the most important person in the world whenever they were around him. So one Sunday, even though Ben had never been to church, Ben... He went to the church, and, and when he got there, he got there late, and he would leave early so that he wouldn't attract any attention to himself. But Ben liked what he heard. And for the first time, Ben had a little glimmer of hope. Through the message, Ben got the idea that he really could amount to something and that God loved him in spite of his not knowing his earthly father. So Ben was back the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. And finally, about the sixth or seventh Sunday, Ben was so engrossed in the message that he was hearing, and his, and his, his uh, hope was growing so much that as he, uh, he forgot to make his early escape. So as Ben was trying to make his escape from the church, he felt a hand on his shoulder. Ben turned around, and there was the preacher who asked him the one question everyone all of Ben's 12 years of life had been wondering. The preacher said to him, Whose boy are you? You can imagine the room suddenly became deathly quiet because everybody wanted to know the answer to that question. But then finally a smile came across the preacher's face. And he broke the silence with this statement. He said, well, I know whose boy you are. Why, the family resemblance is unmistakable. You're a child of God. And then he swatted him on the back and he said, that's quite an inheritance you have there, boy. Now get out there and live up to it. For many years... Ben Hooper still says that that was the day that turned his life around and that got him elected and re-elected the governor of Tennessee. Ben Hooper had a reputation to live up to, and so do we. And so we don't become members of God's family by biological descent. We become members of God's family through a spiritual birth into the family of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and our profession of that faith. And then when we, when we do that, we become the chosen people of God whom God chooses to do His work through. <clears throat> Notice, secondly, Peter says, not only are we the chosen people of God, but we are a royal people. Again, this is no mere compliment, but this is, again, a divine commission. Through Moses, God told the people of Israel, you will be my kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, the believers in the, in the church age, in this age today, we are called a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Peter called Christians a holy priesthood or a royal priesthood. Now, a priest is a go-between. A priest is a meeting place. A, a priest is a bridge builder. We weren't always what we are today, but today we are the chosen people, a royal priesthood priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why is that? Peter tells us our purpose. He says to us that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the royal people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now take note here, if you will, that Peter is talking to the church. And so this is, a, this is a, a, a message not to the professional clergy, not just to pastors or to, to uh, church staff people. This is a responsibility of every believer. Peter is addressing the whole church. When Jesus ascended back up into heaven, he left behind himself only one great organism to continue his work, and that is the church, his church. We are the family of God, and as the family of God, He has made us part of the family business. Now, having said this, he says that, the, that there is a priesthood of believers, and this applies to every believer or every child of God is a part of this royal priesthood. 
This is a, a, a priestly responsibility of every believer to help unbelievers know that God is a, a, know God as they have come to know Him through faith and to introduce the world to Him through their faith. And so the priesthood of believers applies to every believer. Every believer is to play the role of a holy priesthood. That, that is to say that we are to be instrumental in bringing the message of God's grace and love to a dark and needy world today. We are to be the kind of people through whom the unsaved world will be drawn to Jesus because of the Holy Spirit's ministry in and through our lives. We've got a responsibility to the Lord and to the unbelieving world to be the meeting place where the Lord can make contact with the unbeliever and, uh, and they can get acquainted with the Lord because of our witness and because of our testimony. Listen, if, if you and I claim to belong to God, we are the children and the people of God, and we need to act like it. I read one time of a preacher who preached one Sunday morning on honesty to his church. The next day, he took the, church, uh, the uh, city bus to the church office. And when he got on the bus, he gave his fare to the driver, and he went and sat down. The driver had given him back change, and he had given him too much change. On the whole journey to the office, the preacher sat there and pondered in his mind how it is that he could justify that God had just given him some found money. But when he got to his stop, conviction overcame him. And he couldn't handle it anymore, and so he went to the driver, and he said to him, he said, Sir, you made a mistake. He said, When I gave you my fare, you gave me back too much change. The bus driver looked at him and he said, Sir, preacher, he said, That was no mistake. You see, I was at your church Sunday when you preached on honesty. I just wanted to see if you really did practice what you preach. Listen, we have a reputation and a responsibility to live up to. We are the chosen people of God. We are the royal priesthood. And a people want to know if, we, if our practice matches our position in Christ. Notice next that Peter says, thirdly, he said, you are a holy people. Again, this is no mere compliment to us. This is a, another divine commission we, to, to the people of God. We the people of the church. God had told Israel, I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. In other words, God had uh, determined that there should be a difference between Israel and, uh, and his people and the other nations who did not know him. Here Peter tells the church, we are the people, the, we the people are the church, we are a holy people. That word holy is kind of unfamiliar to a lot of people today in our modern times. In the Hebrew language it means to be separate or distinct, to be something different than the common and profane. Paul wrote to the church for he, talking about God, chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. In this passage, Paul is speaking to us, he is saying to us that God is the subject, but the believer is the object. What this means is that God makes us holy. We don't. We're not going to be holy on our own. We're only going to be holy because he makes us holy. Now, as a people of God, we are called upon to be holy as the Lord is. And that, that's a, that is to be different from the world. It does not mean to be perfect. It does not mean that we'll never make a mistake again. It does not mean that we will never sin again. Uh, but as we have voluntarily committed our lives to the Lordship of Christ, we are to be different as the Lord lives His life in us and through us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And uh, as we do this, we should live, we should speak, we should labor, we should study. We should serve far differently than those in the world and the way they do. Uh, because of His Spirit's person and presence and power in us, husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, salesmen, doctors, mechanics, athletes, you name it, if you, are, if you claim to be a child of God, we should be different than the people of the world. Now the truth of the matter is that uh, about us is really we're probably just a mixed bag. And what I mean by that is, if you're honest, if we're honest with ourselves, you have to admit that there are uh, times that our motives aren't pure. There are times in our life, more often than not, that we have big doses of selfishness 
and uh, it's our desire to, uh, that they take over our lives from time to time. We desire to serve ourselves more than we do others, and certainly more than we do the Lord. Uh, but you see, the key to our holiness is simply this. You've got to be willing and able to take an honest look into your heart and to see what you find there. Uh, do you find a heart focused on spiritual truth, integrity, and honesty? Or do you find something else there? Our holiness really is a matter of the heart. And, and, and the, the matter of the heart is what it is full of. If you want to check the current state of, and status of your personal holiness, you can do it. And the way in which we do that is by doing some serious soul searching, and it starts by checking the condition of our hearts. Being a holy people does not mean being perfect. In fact, the opposite is true. What being a holy people means is to be so filled with God's love, so full with His grace, His wisdom, that we cannot conceal His presence in us as we live in this world. Dr. Paul Brand was speaking to a medical college in India on the passage of Matthew 5.16, which reads, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In front of the doctor was a, and the lectern was an oil lamp with its cotton wick burning in a shallow dish of oil. So when the oil ran out, the wick burned dry and smoke came up and it made the preacher begin to cough. He immediately used that opportunity as an illustration. He said, some of you are like this wick, he said. We're trying to shine for the glory of God, but we stink. He said, that's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel for our witness rather than the Holy Spirit. You see, wicks can last indefinitely and burn brightly without irritating smoke or as long as the fuel is the Holy Spirit and it is in constant supply. Peter says, listen, we, the people, the church, are a chosen people. We are a royal people. We are a holy people. And then lastly, Peter says, listen, we are God's people. And that's what he's getting at. Again, no mere compliment. This is a divine fact and a commission. He says, for the Christian to claim that they are God's people is more than an egotistical bragging. He's saying, listen, to, to claim to be a, a, a people of God is... is something that is real. It means to be a possession. Now, to, to falsely claim to be a child of God is blasphemy. But to claim to be God's people means that God owns me. I am His possession. And if we look, we understand the church is God's personal possession. Uh, listen, this means that He is Lord, that He is God, that He is the sole owner. This means that His will, His authority, His ways are what is to be honored and respected above all else. And we can measure the degree upon which we are His church and on which we are His people by the degree to which we dedicate ourselves to doing His will and obeying His commands. But notice also the church is God's purchased possession. Paul told the church at Ephesus that Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her to make her a holy cleansing, holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Christ purchased the church at a great price. He loves his church that much. But not only that, but also notice that the church is God's precious possession. We, the people are God's precious possession. We are chosen, the chosen ones through whom God chooses to do His work today. We are the people, the ones who have, are to spread the message. What message? The message of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe upon Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. We the people are now today to come together as a local church to share the world with the world starting with our community and then branching out into the whole world the good news of God's love through Christ and his salvation through our conduct and through our conversation well, let me ask you a question today are you a part of God's church are you a member of the household of God both locally and universally uh, did you know the Bible tells us that pastors are to be accountable for their members at the local visible church. That's true. 
But the problem is it's getting more and more difficult for us to be accountable for our members when we're not really sure who they are. Uh, I can tell you every pastor has to speak to his own experience in, at this level. But, uh, but I can tell you at our church, here at Tanglewood Community Church, I know that we have many faithful members. We also have many unfaithful members. But where it gets interesting is that we also have a whole other group of people who attend our church every Sunday whom I would call the faithful non-members. In fact, uh, we even have some unfaithful non-members. You're beginning to see the challenge, I hope. So since we are to give an account before the Lord as pastors, let me encourage you to make a commitment to God's church. Regardless of where you've been serving and worshiping Jesus, now listen, I know that in some churches where there's no one to ask for accountability and, uh, and you just show up or you don't show up and nobody really cares, but that's not the New Testament model. That's not the church that Jesus is building or has in mind. Christ is committed and has committed himself to the church. He committed himself so much to the church that it took him all the way to the cross at Calvary. Now I'm asking you to do what Jesus did. I'm asking you to pick up your cross and follow him. First, follow him in New Testament faith and devote yourself to Christ in fellowship and obedience. Jesus, the master carpenter, before he began his earthly ministry, is still today building and establishing his church. And uh, as a Savior and Lord, he continues this process. Today, his church is not a building. It's not a location. It's not a place or an address. It is we, the people. We are the chosen people, the royal priesthood, a holy people. And most importantly, we are God's people. So have you joined God's church through faith in Christ? Somebody says, well, how do you join the universal church? Well, you do it through faith in Jesus. If you've not become a faithful follower of Christ or, or a believer upon Christ and you would like to do that today, I'm going to ask you, to pray a simple prayer that goes something like this with me. Jesus, I believe you're God's son, and I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sin and eternal death. And I choose today to turn from my sin and to trust in you to be my Lord and Savior. I receive you by faith, and thank you for making me a child of God. I trust in you to give me the strength and the wisdom that will help me to follow you each day of my life. My friend, the Bible simply says that those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. Simply calling upon Him in faith, recognizing Him as Savior and Lord, turning from your sin and trusting in Him is how we become a part of the universal church. But let me ask you this, have you joined the local church? Now in our case here at Tanglewood, I'm just going to tell you there are, there are many folks who come and go throughout the season. And they have a home church, and then they have this church. And many of our people have chosen to have dual memberships, and that's all right, because wherever you are, and, and uh, if you're back home or you're here, you ought to be committed, and you ought to be a member of the church, and you ought to be accountable to the church, and you ought to be a participant in the church, more than just an attender, but a committed member to the church. So if you join the local church to become one of the people of God to help meet the needs, of the community and the world in introducing them to Christ, to join Tanglewood Community Church. Somebody says, well, how do I do that? Well, if you have an interest in joining Tanglewood Community Church, I would simply ask you to call me as a pastor so we could set up an appointment and sit down and talk about uh, how to become a member of this local church and what is involved with that. We'd love to have you be a part of our church. Listen, don't just be a part of the universal church. Commit to being a part of the local church where we can come together as family and friends in faith and fellowship and serve the Lord together. Pray with me now. Father, thank you so much for giving us the church that Jesus is building, that he is building in and through us. Help us to be the church here at Tanglewood and local churches all across this country. Father, help us to be the church that, uh, that Jesus is building. Help us to love our church. Help us to love our church the way that Jesus loves the church. Church, I'm going to ask you this morning to go ahead and uh, pray with me. Pray with me this morning in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friend, do you believe that prayer this morning? Do you believe that you want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? I believe that one of the things that God has made clear to us through his word is his will is that we come together as one body of believers in the local church, serving him in this community together, reaching out, showing them, uh, those around us, the love, the grace, and the mercy of God. So as you go out of the mission field this week and head out to be around those who are looking for Jesus, just remember, there are many people in the world today looking for Jesus and don't even know it. Let's help them to see them, him and meet him in us. Be Jesus to all those that you meet. And God willing, we'll be back together in person on March the 7th. We're looking forward to that. Until then, have a blessed week. God bless.